Wendy Dillard, how are you doing today? I am doing well. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm kind of curious. I want to know, is there a job that you had before we get into it? Is there a job that you had that uh, was more valuable than its pay at whatever point in time during your kind of working career? Ooh. I would say, and I feel like this is like totally cliche, but I, I would say my current job um, would, would definitely uh, fit that. And, and if I can't do my current job, fine, I'll do a, a prior job. I'll, maybe the job right after college. So um, right after college, I, so I was the president of an organization, a Christian organization that focused on African-American students while I was in college at the University of Michigan. And then immediately after that, I took on a role to work with their organization as in, I took a fellowship of sorts where I had to actually raise funds to work for them. I would say that the pay was, was very minimal, but I would say that was probably one of the best decisions I could have ever made in that it kind of helped me to realize that regardless as to what you want to do in a career, there's a place for you. Um, the fact that I had to raise funds uh, to work on an initiative that I wanted to work on, um, quite honestly, that drove me to always make sure that everything I did uh, post that position was something I actually wanted to do. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty solid. A little little better. I, I guess you had better uh, jobs than I did. I, I, you know, the closest thing I could think of was uh, filling gag magazine orders in a warehouse that led me into an insurance thing. Yeah, it can't be worse than this, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, so I, I think think we all have our own sort of special place for those things. But yeah, that's very interesting. I'm kind of curious, you know, since you did maybe have that inclination to go with this job, obviously there's, there's a lot of purpose and sort of... Um, kind of importance to what you're doing. What, what is, I mean, what is going on just in your world? How, how have you been sort of adapting to what is happening around the last, you know, month, almost a year now um, with everything? So are we referencing this fabulous pandemic that we're currently in? That would be the one. Okay. Yeah. It has been uh, quite interesting. So ironically in January, we hosted our very first diversity summit. The Level Up Agent Summit um, focused on uh, essentially tying in diversity and inclusion into business practices and helping that to essentially be a part of the DNA of your business versus a separate diversity uh, conference, which is quite honestly why we didn't call it a diversity summit. We called it the Level Up Agent Summit. So that event went absolutely fabulous. Uh, we felt everybody left super duper energized and wanting to build a more uh, inclusive culture across their businesses and understanding the innovation uh, in doing so and how it does truly impact your bottom line. Um, and then uh, come March, it was time to kind of get back to work. And initially, the thought process was we were going to do encore presentations of a lot of the breakout sessions we did at the Level Up Agent Summit. And then the fabulous pandemic started. So we did one session uh, in March, uh, the very beginning of March, we did Women Who Lead Remarkably. We had that as an encore type of session, webinar of sorts. And then when it was time to go into some of the other breakout sessions from Level Up, uh, we had the pandemic that started. So we realized, uh oh, we need to backtrack. And as much as this is very important, we want to make sure that we stay in the moment of relevancy. How do, you, how do you manage in a time like this, in a time of crises where everyone's at home? So we started with a webinar focused on your agency success starts with you. And the purpose of that webinar is to emphasize the importance of self-care and team care. We have that session that will be the opening um, encore presentation of the our let's conference our fall conference that takes place on october 19th uh so yeah that was essentially where we kind of shifted and that was march then after march uh we had the situation that took place with george floyd uh at the very end of may that was the first time our association as a whole responded to a social justice issue, at least I would say under our current CEO, who's been, I believe, the CEO for probably going on 20 years now. He's uh, Bob Rustbelt. And after that, that trickled down to other things, but I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So I'm not sure if you have another question before I continue to talk. There's always more questions, Whitney, but I think the, you know, the interesting thing that, that, you know, around this whole time that we're sort of still in is, you you brought up the the point to me about you know mentorship and how um, you know creating sort of a culture and an environment to where you know younger people in the business are are being 
uh, brought into a place where they're being taught to have these conversations and continue the momentum themselves and maybe help, imp- you know, kind of push that change forward a little faster. What does that look like in terms of, um, you know, again, how is it affecting the progress of, of things? And, and what do you think maybe should be an expectation that, that is maybe set across the industry for that sort of mentorship to take place on a maybe wider scale? So we actually started a mentorship program a few years ago, 2017, and it started as a pilot project and specifically focused on um, developing agency owners, independent agency owners. And the thought process behind it was we have three in-person meetings a year. Two of them are in new locations typically. So as we would go to those two new locations, two other locations, the one meeting is always in DC. So spring meeting is always in DC, but our fall and winter meeting always rotates across the country. So as we would go and meet across the country for our fall uh, and winter meetings, we realized there was an opportunity to connect with local um, diverse uh, diverse agencies. And in this respect, we were more so looking at um, people of color and um, LGBTQ. I don't know that we specifically singled out women as much as we did people of color, LGBTQ, and we didn't single out younger um, agency owners, although in just singling out women and people of color, there were younger agency owners that um, ended up coming to the table and and coming to our meetings. But the key thing that we noticed is a lot of the agency owners, when we asked them, you know, what are the challenges that you're facing? um, A lot of them brought up the challenge of getting appointments with top carriers. Hmm. So we realized, okay, and, and then feeling like it was like, you know, the chicken or the egg kind of thing in that they would go to one carrier and that carrier would say, well, who else, you know, do you have that's a, a top carrier that you're already um, writing business with? And they would say, oh, well, we don't have anyone. They go to the next carrier, get the same question. So nobody wanting to essentially be that first person to provide this person with, with an opportunity. So with that being said, we started the Right Start training series uh, that focused on Agency 101 types of principles, um, how agency operations, um, employees, how to make sure that you are um, using your employees um, to to the best of your ability, uh, leveraging your employees um, within your agency. And then another session that focuses on carrier appointments, how do you get, like, what do you do before you solicit a carrier appointment and what do you do after you receive that appointment? And lastly, what does yearly planning look like? So that's essentially the four different pieces that this training series focused on. And we realized, okay, we have this fabulous training series. We're wanting to see more um, scratch agencies come in and, and be a part of the IA channel. One of our, actually a few of our diversity council members said, well, how are we going to make sure this training series is actually effective? And shouldn't we actually go through this with people to make sure that they can actually, they're, they're gaining the information and how do we know, how are we able to help them a little bit further along on the areas that they're, they're not doing so well on? So that's how we started the mentorship program and the mentorship program. Um, we're looking at underrepresented agency owners, including um, individuals that are under the age of 42 that are agency owners, people of color, women, people of the LGBTQ community. And the thought process is we are essentially taking them and we are linking them up to two mentors. One mentor that is a seasoned or veteran agency owner, however, whatever you'd like to call it, from a different state. And then the other member uh, or the other mentor is someone from the company ranks. And this is not guaranteeing, guaranteeing them an appointment, but it's giving them an opportunity to go through this Right Start training series with someone who has the expertise that they're desiring uh, to have. And we've done this twice before, um, one, in t- one time in 2017, one time in 2018. Because of the, our fabulous conference that took place in uh, January, we did not um, embark on the mentorship uh, pilot in 2019. But this year, uh, we are releasing our very first cohort of sorts post-pilot uh, with the program. And we think that is really cool in that the individuals that we have that are being men- mentored are look very different than the individuals that are doing the mentoring. And we found that these although this is more of a formal mentorship program that after the mentorship program and even during organic relationships are built from it. Essentially, anytime you have 
an organization such as our organization where it's been around for forever, we're 120 years or so old, you know, you have so many legacy members uh, that just pass on generation, from generation to generation. So it's very easy to be in that country club type of mindset. And I feel like in the way that we're mentoring these up and coming developing agency owners, it's kind of truly showing the, it's, it's, it's practicing the art of inclusion for lack of better words. So that's fascinating that, you know, because uh, carry appointments is a real thing, right? And, and you don't necessarily look at it maybe from that, that way, bringing them into the, you know, from the carrier side and the agency side, what, what have you, do you have any sort of early results as to what, you know, kind of you're hearing from the feedback from people that are in that program? I mean, how, how, how beneficial has it been to sort of get that inside sort of look on both sides from, you know, the different experiences? So I think a couple things. One, I think it's been really helpful that it's, they, they're not meeting with the agency owner mentor and the carrier mentor at the same time. What we found is that there are some people that are gravitating more to that carrier mentor and there are other people that gravitate more to their agency mentor. There's some that gravitate towards both, but the types of questions you're asking your carrier mentor are quite different than the types of questions you're asking your agency uh, owner mentor. So I think we're just really taking a holistic approach to mentoring. And I, it appears thus far that it's been a, a relatively successful program. I know that with our second cohort, we had someone in Georgia, uh, an agency owner in Georgia who participated. She was a uh, minority woman. She was not electronic. So she didn't have any type of electronic forms or any type of uh, systems in place to be electronic, her, to allow her agency to be electronic. And her mentor essentially mentored her. So the agency mentor mentored her on how to you know, go through EDAC or DocuSign, whichever, whatever program they use and how to make sure that you're able to work from home um, on your, with, you're able to have you and your employees set up where they can work from home or work from the office. And it worked out fabulous. And that while she was a part of the mentorship program, they found mold in her agency and she had already learned how to work virtually and already kind of set up her employees so that they knew what to do. So she was able to, for a month and a half, close her agent, her physical location for her agency so that they could address the mold problem because they essentially had to tear out quite a bit of uh, the building. And then she also wanted to be able to create more office space. So had it have not been for the mentorship program, she doesn't necessarily believe it would have been as successful of a, a, a transition. And then the other thing about it is there's a, there's a agent group and I can't remember the name of it. Is it AIOA? I can't remember the name of it. But there's a group exclusively for agents led by agents, and they meet uh, every year. Yeah, it's IAOA. Thank you. They meet every year. Well, these developing agency owners with working with these more seasoned veteran agency owners were invited to participate in these groups. And had they have not had that connection with this person who's been around for a long time and knows what's going on, they probably would have never learned about those types of groups that kind of help them to build an even wider um, network, even outside of our association. So yeah, it's been a really cool program and it's been nice to see um, how agents have, have benefited from the program. We definitely have seen some appointments for with the agencies that have participated in the program. Not every agency got appointed, but there have been some that have been appointed uh, because of the program. Did you get any feedback uh, from those agents that were struggling to get the appointments? Like what are they, like what some of the roadblocks were that, that they felt were maybe standing in their way, some of the things they didn't know um, that could maybe help? Or have you heard anything in terms of, you know, what has come from those, those mentorship programs to where they have maybe um, had a little more familiarity with the carrier side of things to help things along? Is there something that was kind of in the way of that? So we will do a follow-up conversation on that because I want to give you like right. actual like legit Fantastic. data and, and text and all that stuff. Because what we're at, where we're at right now is we're at that 18 month ish point where we feel like, of course we did a, a closing survey after they finished with the mentorship program, but we knew that six months is not really going to be able to truly show the value of the program, especially because again, a lot of these relationships continued on after the mentorship. Uh, program. So we are in the process of doing a, another follow-up just to see, okay, you've been out of the program for quite some time now. Looking back a year and a half ago, like uh, to a year and a half to some people even two years, 
how has this impacted where you are today? So I want to follow up with you on that. I just don't want to, I'd like to give you a thorough follow up on that question. Fair enough, Whitney. So then I, I kind of want to, you, 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 you toss this idea out to me about inclusive leadership and just the idea of leadership in general is sometimes hard to come by and, and it's varying forms of quality. If you had to sort of lay out a definition of inclusive leadership, it sounds like you would know what that means, but is there something that maybe goes overlooked and, and really how that's properly executed? We'll go with this. So in thinking about inclusive leadership, it's essentially constantly considering who's not at the table right here, who's not represented right here. I heard someone use that, Amber Cabral uh, with Cabral Consulting. She was our closing um, keynote at the Level Up Agent Summit. And she just brought that whole idea up where when you're in a different, when you're in a meeting and you're determining what you're doing next within your organization and you're looking around that table, is everyone around that table representative of the organization representative of the population being served is who's missing, who's missing around the table um, and how can we get them there? I would say would be what I constantly um, try to think of when I think of inclusive leadership. This might be a tough question, but have you seen any good examples of inclusive leadership across the industry and, and, and the people that you guys have been working with? Is there something that, you know, might be missing from the day to day, you know, agency that, that they could really look to implement and what they're doing? I'm glad you asked that question. The reason why I'm glad you asked that question is when we talk about diversity and inclusion, um, and even in connecting with our state chapters across the country, there were some states that were very hesitant to have a, a conversation on diversity and inclusion. And they were hesitant because quite often when we're talking about diversity, the first thing that comes to mind is race. And okay, do I have people of color around and I don't, so I don't want to jump on the call because I don't want to look like a failure. Yes, that is a, a piece. When we're talking about diversity and inclusion, that, that, that definitely is something that can be a measurable component to diversity and inclusion, but it's not the end-all, be-all. So one of the things that I had to, or I have continued to, to have to help our state uh, chapters as well as our agencies understand is it's a mindset. If you're practicing the correct mindset, even when you're looking at people of color or whatever the case may be, they're going to, they're they're going to be attracted to your organization. They're, you're going to have an opportunity to be able to reach out to them. And I say that because one of our chat, actually, I think of our um, Ohio chapter, and I'm putting them out there, and they have done a phenomenal job of getting young people into the fold. They realized that they were lacking younger people in their organization. And they did just a really, really good job, like put together um, – think tanks of, of, of sorts and, and, and all of this, these innovative types of ways to make sure that the younger voice is being heard. I really, really liked how they've done that. Um, there's other states that have also done a really good job. I think of Oklahoma, they've done a great job when it comes to women. So essentially taking the same practice that they took for younger professionals or the same practice that they took for women and the fact that they the same, essentially best practices, inclusive leadership, best practices, and realizing that they're transferable to any group. So you don't have to be a expert on diversity and inclusion or race matters for you to be able to take that same thing that you did uh, with younger people or with um, women or in whatever or veterans and transfer that over to the other underrepresented missing person at the table. So I'm curious, you know, cause you said uh, somebody might be hesitant to jump on the call because their agency doesn't, you know, look the way that it might be, uh, you know, that, that, that call might be hoping that it would. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious from the person that let, let's say, you know, you are that person that, that, that you're, you're trying to get somebody into that agency, right. You know, that's not a very, comfortable place to go. I'm the only person like me there. Mm -hmm. How do you go about bridging that gap to where you're saying you, to get the ball rolling, right? Because that takes a brave person to come into an agency that, you know, uh, is, is, is more than likely going to be the only person that, that, that might be outside of that traditional insurance stereotype. Right. So how, like, what, what does that, what does that look like in terms of at least starting that process. I'm, I'm sure you've had conversations with people say, do I really want to go work here? What's that going to be like? Is there some hesitation? How do we help sort of bring that together? There's so many things there. Okay. So I would say if you are within an organization where you do, 
you have that one person and ironically we had a agency in Pennsylvania and that was her struggle. She had that one person and she didn't know how can I be more inclusive? I want to make sure that this person knows that we're an inclusive environment, but they are the only person of color within our agency. What do I do? So with those types of situations, there's so many things that you can do. Um, one thing that I think is very important is providing outlets. So let's say that you hired an African-American, um, you're, you're a primarily white agency and you have one African-American employee. So providing outlets, professional outlets where they are able to not be the only one. So rather that's, you know, making sure that they, making sure that you're aware of some of the multicultural industry organizations that are around and don't just invite them to participate in that organization. Also open that as something, you know, that perhaps you or other people also belong to and participate in. So it's not all oh, because you're black, you should go and do this, but it's, Hey, we're, you know, we support diversity and inclusion. The national, we know about the national African American insurance association. We want to give an opportunity for our staff to get involved. And of course, not mandating staff to be involved, but providing an opportunity for staff to get involved, other things like that. And to me, that's a very important way that you can immediately show that, you know, you do, you, you do want to implement a culture of inclusion and you do want all of your staff to feel comfortable when coming to the table. Right now, another example would be um, with us in the pandemic and all of the, the, the working from home, providing uh, services for working parents that have kids at home, being able to like have a webinar on that or providing support groups. Again, it doesn't necessarily, let's say you only have one, one staff member that has kids at home. Well, it's not going to really be really helpful if you start, <laughs> if you start a, a staff group on, on that. But if you were able to find out what, what are some external communities that they can belong to and then offering that to your organization. And again, figuring out ways that you can, as a, as a, a company, get involved in, in in that can truly show your support and in inclusive leadership. All right, Whitney, we've had a couple of conversations over the years and, and, you know, I think you mentioned in the beginning of just the, the patience that, you know, maybe is required, the fact that it might not be going as fast as you would maybe want it to in, in the attempts to maybe just sort of uh, uh, look the other way on that for a second, if you could have the ability to sort of just give everybody the maybe one little thing that just helps it go just a little faster. Is there something that you've seen over the course of the years that, that does help, you know, even in a small way, kind of move things, move that progress bar a little bit faster? Yes. Collaborations. Um, I think is the, one of the most important things um, and moving things forward. And quite honestly, even with the national organization, the big I, uh, and what we've been doing on our diversity council, if it wasn't for the external collaborations that we started to participate in, I don't know that we will have, we would have evolved to the level that we've evolved to today, recognizing that you can't do it by yourself and you need external people to help you in moving, uh, the needle forward. All right. We have got three more questions for you. Okay. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. But what's something that you hope you never forget? That you live to work and you don't work to live. All right. Simple, straight to the point. On the other side of that, what's something that you have yet to learn? Hmm. Um, I'm going to go with the balancing act. I'm still very much learning uh, the balancing act. And I hope that I will eventually be very good at that work-life balancing act, but I am not there yet. <laughs> well, no one says how balanced, you know, what, what the balance needs to be, you know, I mean, so it's always up to you. But Whitney, last question to you. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to, you know, present you with a, a magic wand of sorts to really do change, uh, speed up anything that you want in the insurance industry, where is it going? What's it doing? And how are you getting there? Um, I would say the, I would go with the whole talent pipeline. I know that we talk about it all the time, but figuring out how do we do a better job of making it truly known uh, all of the opportunities within the insurance industry. And I feel like this is such a cliche answer, but I say that because every time I've had an opportunity um, to connect with college students on it and talk to them about the various 
things that they could be doing in the insurance industry and, and how it's so multifaceted and how if you are interested in music, you can go that route. Or if you're interested in healthcare, there's things in healthcare that you can get involved with. Uh, it, it, it totally amazes me how people are still, they, they don't know. And there's just so much that we can be selling and we don't really do a good job selling. But we already know that that's the case. So it's a cliche answer, but I'm going to stick with that one. Winnie, this has been great. I'm going to leave it right there. Okay. Thank you, Joe.